grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord, our Savior, who is Jesus Christ. Amen. Our focus for today, Matthew chapter 6, some selected verses from that chapter. This is a portion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Please listen to Jesus' words to us. He says, Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So there's this book by Jules Verne written quite a few years ago called The Mysterious Island. In the book, Jules Verne takes us back to Civil War days. There are these guys stuck in a prisoner of war camp in squalor. It was miserable down in the south. They longed to escape from that prisoner of war camp. And one day, the opportunity just came along in the middle of the camp. There was this hot air balloon that was used as a supply balloon. And there it was, just sitting, unguarded. The soldiers took the opportunity. They jumped in. I let loose the tether lines, and up, up and away, they made their great escape. It was a beautiful thing. They were happy. And as they cruised along in the sky, they realized, wow, we got all this stuff, all these supplies that we need. This is awesome. But then they ran out of fuel, and uh, they had also experienced another problem. They had ventured out. The winds had taken them out over open water. You know what happens to a hot air balloon when you can't keep it fired up? It starts to lose altitude. And that was what was going on, and the guys figured, you know, we better lose some of this ballast. And they looked around, what should we throw over? Well, we don't need this ammunition. It's really heavy. We don't need these guns. Threw them over. Gained a lot of altitude, bought themselves some time. But again, the balloons started to get closer to the water. They realized, we're going to splash down unless we do something. So they took off their coats. They took off their shoes. They even threw over the food in the water. And again, they bought more time. and It happened again. The balloon got closer and closer to the water, and they realized, we got nothing else to throw overboard. What are we going to do? I figure about that time these guys were probably saying their prayers, making themselves right with their maker. When one of them came up with a bright idea, hey, guys, what would happen if each one of us took a rope from this gondola basket, untied it, tied it into a loop, if we just sat in that loop, got rid of the other uh, ropes there, untied them, and got rid of this basket that we're standing in. And they said, well, we got nothing to lose, so splash, they lose that basket. You have this picture in your head. Can you picture it? These guys hanging by a rope <laughs> with this hot air balloon above them. And uh, as it turned out for them, it bought them just enough time that they got within sight of the mysterious island in the name of the book. They splashed down and sw swam to the safety of the island. And I'm thinking, whew, <laughs> what an escape. More than that, do you think they learned anything that day about setting priorities? You know, when they got into that basket and made their escape, they thought, good, we've got all these things. We need these things. And just so quickly, they were forced to prioritize. Don't need this. Don't need that. Until it came down to their number one priority, and what was that? Just let me hang on to this rope for dear life. Nothing else mattered. Now I want you to do some work for yourself. Uh, you've got your priorities. But if you were forced to say, I don't need this one, I don't need that one, until you got down to your number one priority, what would that rope be that you cling to most dearly? Let's see. Sunday morning... 
This is, this is pretty much a Sunday school question for you, isn't it? What's your number one? Isn't it Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus? I want to cling to Jesus. But what you and I can find so easy to say on a Sunday morning is a little bit tougher to live out and practice in the rest of the week. Uh, you know how it goes. Coworkers, classmates, our good friends, maybe our own family members, the influence of our whole culture coming at us through media, just our own selfish flesh boiling up inside of us. So many things can take us away from having Jesus as that number one priority and trade it in for other priorities along the way. The money stuff, the, the, the fun stuff of this world, whatever it might be. Now, we can say, well, that's not a big deal, is it? But uh, I want you to listen to the words of Jesus again. You realize he sees it as a big deal. Why? Because he knows what's good for us. He knows what's terrible for us. And uh, we like to play this game that we can dance with money and say, yeah, you're my number one priority right now. But then, okay, Jesus, you're really my one, number one priority right now. And, and he's saying that that doesn't work. Uh, what is your number one priority? Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Uh, you know, it's no wonder Jesus is saying you can't serve both God and money. He wants to make it clear to us. He wants to be that number one. He wants to be the one that we hold most dear to him. And uh, I'm going to share the words again, and I want you to pick out what the challenge is if we choose the the world thing, the money thing, the possession train to hitch ourselves onto. What's the weakness in that? Jesus says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Did you catch it? What's the problem with this? Uh, just take any car a person buys. If they hang onto that car for more than 10 years, what's it looking like? not so new and shiny and all of a sudden that that uh, big investment looks like trash uh, money's temporary it's only here for a while or you know it's a great thing to get a paycheck isn't it and some of us get it auto deposited into our checking account and that's pretty that's pretty awesome i got paid and yet how long does it take before we say give me a reload you know the money in money out just so quickly Money's temporary. I have yet to attend a funeral where, you know, they take the casket out to the hearse, and the hearse has a trailer hitch attached at the back side where all the per per person's possessions goes into a trailer. They get to take their cash with them. They leave it all behind, and you and I leave it all behind as well. Money is temporary. And you compare the temporary nature of stuff, of money, to what God is and how he describes himself to us in the word. Who is this God? Well, this is the God who knows us intimately. He knows the count of the hairs on our head. If he knows that about us, he also knows what's going on inside of our head. He cares about us deeply. This is the God who not only created us, this is the God who comes to us and says, you need forgiveness. You need my help. You need my rescue. And here's the rescuer, Jesus, in love. This Jesus has laid down his life for your sins. He's, he's washed you clean of all of your sins. And by the power of the Spirit that this God gives to us, he attaches us to this Savior, Jesus. And we can say, I'm now a redeemed, forgiven child of God. I'm an heir of heaven. This God loves me unconditionally. And it's these powerful truths of the gospel that the Spirit uses inside of us to shape us and to form us and to help us with these challenges of the God and money dilemma. Um, just think about it. When has money ever really given you freedom from sin the way 
Jesus has given you full freedom by, from sin by his life and death on the cross. Or when you come up here and you commune and you receive Christ's body and blood with that bread and the wine and, and you hear the words given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. You know the peace and quietness that comes with that? Uh, the reality of Christ coming to you in the supper? When has money ever bought you that kind of peace, that kind of quietness that, that hits deep inside your soul and sends a shiver down your spine because God loves me this much? Or, you know, my money, it could care less if I see it or not. It cares nothing about me, and yet I've got a good shepherd calls me his very own and is with me all the time uh, he says uh, hey all your cares all your anxieties cast them on me I care for you and we hear all these things and we realize uh, oh Jesus this is what you're talking about but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well this is a great place to be you and I can say we are the redeemed, forgiven children of God, heirs of heaven, and we can say, Jesus, you're my number one priority. Uh, may you always be that rope that I'm clinging to. Now, can I take it one step further with you? Uh, I want to take it to an area of our lives where that God and that money thing intersect in a very personal way. Let's talk about our offerings to the Lord. And some of you are saying, oh, no, he's going to go there. Please don't go there. Uh, walk with me. Uh, you'll like where we wind up. Uh, I know for so many of us, the offering can be uh, uh, an area of guilt, where maybe we feel like, uh, you know, I haven't done what I should have. Uh, or it can be an, an area where uh, we're very focused, maybe, you know, we're some of the money people at church and we're looking at this and we're worried about the offering and funding the budget and we turn an offering into just a funding mechanism uh, but it can be so much more uh, take you into the book of Malachi uh, in this section God is calling out the Old Testament priests and as he calls them out I think by extension he's really calling out all the people the priests were serving, too. Uh, listen to what God says. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If I'm a father, where is the honor due me? If I'm a master, where is the, the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? And then God lays it out plain as day. Listen to this. When you bring blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice crippled or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty, when you bring injured, crippled, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices? Should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Get a picture of what was happening? Uh, I wonder if there was even some payola going on with the priests and saying, well, you know... Uh, if you bring enough my way, I'll accept that one, even though it's a defective offering. It's, it's uh, you know, you, you bring the, the cattle in on a cart, there's a problem, isn't there? Uh, what was going on? Uh, it seems as if the people were skimping. They were getting by, and they're saying, well, I'll meet the uh, letter of the law, and we'll just check this box off. Yeah, I brought an offering, okay? Uh, as you look at this, it almost seems like uh, God was being very demanding, though, doesn't it? Like, okay, if you're going to bring me an offering, I, I, I only deserve the very best. A cynical person could certainly look at that way, that God's just being selfish. Or is there more going on here than just saying, folks, do a quality control check on your offering? I think there was more going on. There was a stronger message behind this. Maybe a Maybe an example from life. Let's say you're thinking about Christmas time, and in the past you've always done a rather shoddy job of selecting gifts for your loved ones. And this year you say it's going to be different. And 
So you figure out the perfect gift for each person, and you think, I've nailed it this year. You're exchanging gifts, and sure enough, everybody is just delighted what you, what, with the gift that you selected for them, and you're opening your gifts. And you're not having the same kind of experience. Every single gift you receive is broken, it has a hole in it, it's smelly, whatever the case is, it seems as if they haven't even put any thought into the gifts that they're bringing to you. And what are you thinking? I love these folks. I, I gave them a beautiful gift this year, and then they bring me this kind of stuff. What's going on here? And you might even start asking the question, I love them. Do they love me? And about that point, maybe we can get a good flavor of where God was coming from here. Uh, what is the offering really all about? Isn't it about the relationship? And, and who is this God? This is a God who loves me, who cares about me, who has lavished me so richly with love and forgiveness and spiritual care the power of his spirit. This is the God who watches over me from moment to moment, who has written my name in the book of life in heaven. This is the God who sent his son, who laid down his lifeblood for me. This is the God whom I confess and say, I love you. Uh, God, you're my, you're my number one. I, I hang on to that rope. And it's this God that then comes to me and says, hey, could you bring me an offering? my reaction you want me to bring you an offering I'd love to bring you an offering uh, Lord let me pray about this let me think about this I want to pick out the perfect gift for you and I bring this gift to you and I lay it before you and I say Lord I love you And if we can get there with what we're doing with our personal stewardship of money, with our gifts and offerings for the Lord, I think that's a beautiful place to be, isn't it? Uh, and and so, so many of those other views of our offering are, are really demeaning of a, of a beautiful privilege that we have, a personal privilege with that relationship that the Lord has drawn us into. Uh, could I close with a, a story? There's a punchline at the end, and uh, nobody was hurt in the telling of this joke, so, so don't worry about it. Uh, there was this young investment banker, and he had been doing very well with his career. Along the way, uh, his managers noticed that. They gave him a big promotion and a raise that matched it, and he was thrilled. So what does he do? He runs out on a shopping spree to celebrate, the last place he stops is the BMW dealership, picks up a brand new car. He's thinking, this is pretty cool. Goes for a drive, winds up in the hills and winding in the roads and just loving life. Goes a little bit higher, it starts to sprinkle. He doesn't worry about it. But again, he's winding down these mountain roads, gaining altitude, and all of a sudden, the rain had started to freeze on the roadbed, and he hadn't realized it. He finds himself spinning down this mountainous road. He realizes he's not going to quite get it stopped in time. The car is going to go over the edge. The last moment, he, he throws himself out of the car but experiences a very uh, ugly thing. He actually lost his left arm. Oh, the car goes toppling down. It's burst into flames. Well, there's this truck driver that saw the whole thing take place. And as the trucker pulls his rig to a halt, he hops out. He runs up to the banker and says, Sir, sir, uh, we've got to get you some help. And here's the banker, and he's just wagging his head back and forth, and he's moaning and he's groaning, and he says, My BMW, my brand-new BMW. And the trucker says, Sir, you've got bigger problems than that. Uh, we've got to find your arm. Maybe we can... Uh, air ambulance you and a surgeon can reattach that arm and save your life and that arm. 
About that time, the banker took a look at where his left arm had been, and he moans, and he groans, and he wags his head back and forth, and he says, my Rolex, my brand new Rolex. Folks, your priorities are very important, aren't they? <laughs> and it's important that you and I have the right priorities, especially our number one priority. And it's my prayer that Jesus is that rope that you cling to and hold to most dearly all of your life. Amen. The peace of God that goes beyond all understanding. Keep your hearts your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand as we join in confessing our Christian faith with people around the world, the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 